Welcome to this Bite Size PD, where the topic is tips for using Canvas to prepare for remote and online learning. Uh, the learning intention for this session is I'm learning about ways to utilize Canvas and Parent Square to support online remote learning so that I can prepare for an unexpected online remote learning day situation. And the success criteria, I will know I'm successful when I can pick a tip or idea to implement in order to help when I find myself preparing for an unexpected online remote learning situation. Here's a quick rundown of the agenda for this session. I'll start with what do you mean preparing for remote online learning? And then there's 10 tips uh, to share. These are tips, ideas, um, hoping that we'll have ideas for you that you can take and implement into your own practice to support you with preparing for remote and online learning. So what do I mean remote online learning? It's expecting the unexpected. I actually have a, a an image of one of my favorite shows, Big Brother, where their mantra is expect the unexpected. Um, I think we've all found ourselves in situations, especially the, you know, the past few years where we've had a, unexpected snow days, um, unexpected remote learning, where as a school, we had to quickly shift from in person to online. Um, I know as educators, we've always been expected to have emergency sub plans because uh, you never know if something might happen and you need an emergency sub. Uh, what I'm about to share today as well can also be applied to regular sub plans. And I want to make sure I'm honoring the work that all of our teachers in our district do, the great work. I know there's a lot of teachers out there who do a great job of planning for remote and online learning. They have snow days, emergency sub plans, kind of waiting in the wings in their Canvas courses. So the point of this presentation is just to help provide tips and ideas um, that any educator could hopefully take something from to implement and maybe use. Um, so tip number one is to utilize the best practices for digital teaching and learning. So really starting with that TPAC framework, this is one that we have shared over and over and over again that whether it's online or even in person, when it comes to utilizing technology, number one, we should always think about what are we what are we going to teach? Going back to those standards, looking at the core. Um, and so when you're planning for emergency or remote and online learning, that's the same. We should still be looking at maybe the scope and sequence, utilizing our instructional guides, and what really are those skills and concepts that should be covered. Um, how are we going to teach it? So going back to those best practices, those instructional strategies, um, part of which are those best practices for digital teaching and learning, which I'll talk about in just a second. Um, so knowing what you're gonna teach, how you're going to teach it, and then what technology, if any, will support the learning goal and outcomes. Because we wanna make sure, even though it might be remote online, you still wanna ensure that the technology um, that you're implementing or expecting students to use will truly support the student learning goals and outcomes. Uh, the best practices for digital teaching and learning, those were created and identified to support our instructional strategies, our instructional uh, priorities. So they're not one more thing, it's the stuff you guys are already doing, but with a digital teaching and learning lens. So with the learning environment, making sure you are creating and establishing that safe learning environment. And when things are remote and online, Canvas is that extension of your classroom, that learning environment. So you wanna to remember to make sure you are following those CSD expectations and style guides and whatever expectations your admin um, have for your Canvas use and sharing it with students and families. Uh, thinking about teacher clarity, I already talked about um, considering those three elements of TPAC. Uh, but also communicating those learning intention success criteria with your students, maybe creating a page in Canvas that actually says, here's the learning intention success criteria and a list of the tasks you want students to uh, complete. Um, and I'm not gonna go through each of these, these um, best practices explicitly, but thinking about are there opportunities for that online remote learning to provide some explicit instruction and what can that look like and feel like for students? Are there opportunities for practice? Are there opportunities for students to demonstrate their understanding to you, so a form of assessment? And then are there opportunities to personalize the learning considering all of those students that you learn and their experiences, um, maybe providing some choice and voice into what it is they're working on during that online remote learning time? So, but I mean, tip number one, and I think our teachers do a great job of this, is still utilizing those best practices, thinking about what you're teaching, how you're going to teach it, and then what technology will best fit to support those learning goals and outcomes. 
Tip number two, and I think this is a really important one, is just being aware of the access your students will have because what students have access at home versus school is different. Uh, you can't always guarantee students will have access to Wi-Fi or if they have access to Wi-Fi, that it's a strong enough bad bandwidth to maybe do all of the activities you're asking. Um, they may not even have access to devices. Uh, you also, and beyond just like digital, um, you also wanna think about what they have access to even if you have students completing activities offline, uh, do they have access to the resources that you're wanting them to access and use, whether it's paper, pencil, books, um, if you're doing if your science activity or an experiment of some sorts, would they have access to the materials maybe you're referencing? So it's just being aware of your students and depending on what you're designing and planning for, what will they have access to? And do you have, um, alternatives in case the access might be limited. Just being aware and in the know of this. Tip number three, and I actually love the image I have on here. It's someone kind of lurking in the background. I think it's always a great idea to have uh, an unpublished module or page in Canvas that is waiting in the wings, so to speak, so that when the time comes, you have to quickly make a shift because usually when it comes to snow days, emergency sub days, unexpected uh, remote learning days, I've learned that Usually you have a couple of hours, you might have a day, uh, depending on the situation, but it's nice to have something created waiting in the wings. So all you have to do is hit publish and make it available to your students. And this is something that I've seen a lot of teachers have, um, especially for snow days. And I know a lot of principals do expect emergency sub plans. And so this is a great thing to have and show your admin that you have as well. So once again, you don't have to take time to create something, it's already waiting. So thinking about things that you can do, um, maybe it's a module or a page for, to review or preview com, uh, content. Maybe it's some end of the year testing preparation that you can have waiting and maybe you don't use it throughout the year, but then when the, that review time comes for test prep, you can publish those modules or pages and then you have some test prep information and activities for students. Um, an elementary example that was shared with me is that uh, elementary teachers could build a page reminding their students how to access their playlist in Wonders. Um, that provides a checkoff sheet and, or choice board for what they can go, or, I'm sorry, and provide like a checklist or a choice board where students can go. So you're not just saying, here's how you access your playlist. It's also directions or how or what you want them to do. And I will be, I will be honest, like my use of Wonders is little, but I do know, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, the playlists align with the teacher's calendars in Wonders. And so by having this page, you don't have to keep going in each week and like editing what the story is or whatever the unit might be. It's aligned with your um, your content. So you can have this page be generic enough where depending on the time frame, um, the topic itself doesn't matter. The directions will still work um, and be applicable. So you can always reach out to one of the elementary specialists too if you want more information on that. Um, they might be able to give you a clearer explanation than I just did. And that's just an elementary example and just one example to use, but I think you all have a good idea of what is something that you could have ready to go, could be applied at any time um, based on the content and topics you teach. Uh, tip number four, provide activities to preview content. Um, this is where you can use the subject specific software that you have available. And I know we have a lot of that in our district, like Gizmos is an example, Connect Ed, Savvis, Wonders, HMH, Newzella. Um, a lot of these programs have things that you can quickly pull from so you're not creating it from scratch. And a lot of it aligns with content that maybe you're gonna be teaching coming forward. So just being aware of what, what's out there, what can you quickly have? And maybe once again, you have a page already waiting where it's there ready for you to go. Um, Nearpod's another great resource that we have access to where you can find, meaning you don't have to create it. I still recommend any Nearpod you find, go through it um, slide by slide to make sure there's no surprises and you can always take out what you don't like. Um, so find or create a student-paced Nearpod lesson that can introduce students to through a topic or concept, um, a way to kind of introduce something that maybe you'll get to in a week or two or maybe a few days. Um, utilizing screencasting tools where you can create um, and or find, like there's a lot of great screencasts maybe already out there created, um, some short mini concept lessons. Um, just know any video that you find, I'd make sure you do um, preview the video in its entirety to make sure it is what you want. 
And then um, once again, just making that video available for students to watch. Um, provide reading selections with specific tasks that, that students are expected to complete by a specified due date. And I specifically say that doesn't have to be the next day. So when you do have some remote learning, um, because you never know what the situation might be at home, uh, especially on a snow day. Uh, having content for students to interact with, um, complete, and maybe you give them some time to get that work done. So if they choose for whatever reason not to do it during your the that day, they still are expected to get the work done and turn it in by a specified date. This can also maybe help with students who maybe weren't able to get the access that they needed at home to maybe get some stuff done, maybe when they do it at school, or um, they can work with you on how to get it done. And then utilizing open education resources like Canvas Commons, Khan Academy, um, OER Commons. It's just another, these are resources where you don't have to start from scratch. You can see what's already created and out there, um, just using your teacher lens of what would be appropriate for your students and connect with those learning intentions um, and success criteria. So like tip number four, tip number five is providing activities to review content. So rather than previewing something, it's using like, re use review sources provided in subject specific software that you have access to. And I have those listed over here, like Gizmos, HMH, Wonders, Connect Ed. You all know what, what subject specific resources you use and what you use on a constant basis. Um, a lot of those things will have activities or um review type resources that you can quickly use if you're not already. Um, like the previewing content, utilizing OER resources to locate and provide uh, review activities. You could have students maybe create something. This is where demonstrating um, what they understand, maybe create an infographic or slideshow presentation that demonstrates their understanding of something learned or covered in class. And that's where we have access to tools like Canva, Adobe Express, CSD Docs, where that's Docs, Slides, Drawing Sites, Newzella, and more. So um, one thing I'll say, I would make sure that you're not introducing or expecting students to use programs that you've never used in class. You want to be consistent and make sure you are, um, when you're having them create something like this, it's using a tool that you've already, they've already been using, or at least providing some type of choice so they're not stuck using a program they've never been exposed to before. Um, another an idea is you can create a hyperdoc activity in which students explore and review specific content or a topic. And you can even create a question of the day activity in which students uh, find the answer and they have to send it to you. And these are just ideas, but just thinking about what can you do to provide activities to review content. And then maybe utilize end of year test prepping resources and materials. Uh, it's, uh, it's never too early to start prepping for end of the year testing or reviewing some of that content they could find on an end of year test. Tip number six is to create activities to be completed offline. Just because it's on Canvas doesn't mean it has to be completed on Canvas. Canvas can be used to help maybe provide expectations for the day, directions for the assigned tasks or activities, support resources, uh, contact information. Um, I think it's interesting, especially with sub plans, uh, Canvas can be a great place for a teacher to quickly create a screencast of them giving the directions. So that way it's not up to the substitute, whoever they might be. Um, you could actually have a screencast of you saying, hey kids, I know I'm not there. Here's what I expect you to do. And a lot of times hearing it from the teacher versus just reading it on the page can be very uh, powerful. And then just a rem reminder, be aware a student may or may not what a student may or may not have access to at home. And that was one of those earlier tips. So really reinforcing just because you're using Canvas for those remote online learning days, doesn't mean it all has to be done on Canvas. Um, it can just be that resource to support um, in that learning. And then tip number seven, be consistent with your delivery and organization. I have a picture of um, the six through 12 Canvas expectations and style guide. We do have a version for the elementary. It's just, this guide really is designed just to provide some consistency with our Canvas setup and use across the district. I know schools have added to the expectations and style guide, and that's great. You always wanna align yourself with what your expectations are from your admin. But this consistency does help with um, 
families who might have students in different grades across different schools uh, helps them kind of know where things should go, how to access them. Um, and with your own practice, just being consistent with your own course design, delivery, and organization. The last thing you want to do is have students accessing a course and suddenly things are found in different places. You want to keep with consistency with them. Students get used to routines. And so even little students, kindergarten, first, second grade, I've seen where when it's consistent, they know where to go. They know how to get there. Um, so just being consistent is key. And then as I mentioned previously, um, when talking about reviewing content, you want to make sure you are using program software, ed tech tools, whatever it might be that your students are already familiar with. Um, the last thing you want to do is introduce something brand new uh, that can be a little challenging for students, especially your, your, your younger students and families trying to help those younger students when they're, they're being expected to use something they've never used before or have been taught the expectations for. Tip number eight, uh, provide opportunities for personalization and choice. You want to consider the needs and interests of your individual students, especially, especially those special populations. Um, are there scaffolds and supports you can and should provide? Um, I have choice boards listed in the picture there. Choice boards are a great, great way to maybe provide some choice in activities. Um, Maybe you don't make them do all of the items on the choice board. Maybe you say, I need you to pick at least three to complete. Um, or maybe there's choice boards you're already using within your classroom. I think about elementary. I know you guys even do. Um, elementary is great with cho choice boards. I've seen it used there a lot. Um, but once again, I, I'm rambling about that now. It's just, are there ways for you to provide some elements of choice? Because uh, sometimes choice gets students a little excited to, to complete whatever they're being asked to do. Um, and then utilizing features in Canvas, such as the assign to feature when creating an assignment. That way you can maybe have an assignment and assign it to specific groups of students, um, like individually as, we're, um, as Canvas groups is another way to assign to specific groups. Um, mastery paths, if you're familiar with that feature in Canvas, it's a way to maybe create, not maybe, it's a way to create an assessment that, that checks where students are. And then based on their score, they get taken to an activity. So maybe out of 10 points, a student got one and they get back to maybe some more of a reteaching. They watch some videos, they do some practice questions, whatever it might be. The middle of the road students, maybe they get something a little more challenging. And then you have your, your um, people who, your students who've already aced it, and maybe there's an extension activity for them to do. So just thinking about, are there ways that you can provide some personalization and choice um, when you're designing? a Canvas module or page for those remote and on learning, on, online learning moments. And then tip number nine is utilizing Parent Square. I know many, if not all of our schools are utilizing Parent Square to communicate with families, but what a great tool when it's remote or online to communicate with your families about what you'd like students to do or complete during the snow day, um, how to access the content on Canvas, uh, especially for our elementary students, that might be huge. Um, how to locate a student's username and password using the Skyward Family Access and how they can get supported, get support if needed, whether that support is directly to you. Maybe you have some online Zoom hours or uh, if they email you, you know, maybe email is the best that day, a phone call, or you can even let them know when they can contact Help Desk if they have some um, technical issues. And then as a reminder with Parent Square, it's great for that language translation. So especially during remote learning days, utilizing Parent Square as a way to communicate with all families. Um, so all families are getting the same information. And then just a reminder when using that language translation, you wanna make sure you put everything in text rather than just PDF or images. Um, that doesn't mean you can't include PDFs or images. Uh, PDFs and images just can't be translated. And so that's when the translation wouldn't quite be successful. So just being aware of that, which I think most people are, but it's just a good reminder when we're using Parent Square. And then the last one is collaborate and communicate. And I'm going to move my head because it's covering these words. Um, I think when doing, when, when planning remote and online learning um, things in Canvas, whether it's online, offline, it's great to collaborate and work with your team, whether that's your content team, your grade level PLC. Uh, that way you can create a consistent plan and work together, share the load, so to speak. So it's not just you creating something, it's working together. Um, 
And something to know, families talk and compare. Like some parents will say, what is your teacher asking your students to do? Well, my kids are doing this. Well, mine aren't doing this. Um, it is a way to maybe have some consistency so families can see that uh, students from different different teachers, different grades, or whatever, are, are actually still being asked to do similar type of work, um, maybe similar levels of work or loads of work. Um, I don't mean to say this in a negative way, but families talk and they compare and they know when, wow, your kid had a lot of things, mine had nothing, that's not fair. So I would just be aware of that. But that's where just being, when you work together, um, families know that they, they feel that as well. And then communicating, communicate with your admin, other teachers you may work with, colleagues, your instructional coach. Uh, you never know who might be filtering questions or having to step in and support. So communicating what you have, what your plan is, is a great way to keep um, the stakeholders happy and to keep everyone in the know so that they can also support you, whatever the situation might be for that remote or online learning um, situation. And so those are, and I'm actually going to go back to the very beginning just to go through so you can see a list of all those tips again. Um, so ignore, here we go. I'm going to move myself a little bit more. So here are just those those top 10 tips. Utilizing the best practices for DTL, being aware of the access your students have, create a prepaid unpublished Canvas module or even page that's just waiting in the wings, um, providing activities to preview, review content, um, being consistent or providing activities that can be completed offline, being consistent with your course design, delivery and organization, providing opportunities for personalization and choice, utilizing Parent Square, and then collaborate and communicate. Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me. My name is Camille Cole. I'm a DTL specialist in the Instructional Supports Department. I also know your instructional coaches are great resources as well, or any of the um, specialists in the Instructional Supports Department who can be more content specific. So if you're looking for support specifically for your content, whether it's social studies, ELA, science, math, um, they would love to support you in this. And so with that, I'm going to thank you for watching this Bite Size PD. Um, as always, if you would like some relicensure credit, there is a form here that you can complete. We do award this on a monthly basis. You can also visit our Bite Size PD page to view any of the Bite Size PDs that we have already done this year and prior years. Um, have a great day and thank you for watching.